Hello, everyone. I'm Patrick. I'm a member of the community team at Artbox, and this is a conversation that we are calling Art of Algorithms, featuring Regina Harsani and Golan Levin. We're here to discuss Golan's work, Cytographia, which releases part of the Artbox Curated Collection on January 10th, 2024. Golan Levin is a U.S.-based artist and educator who has been actively professionally in software art since 1995 and a professor of computer art at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and Regina Harsani is the Associate Curator of Media Arts at the Museum of the Moving Image and member of the Artbox Curatorial Board and Preventer Conservator of Time-Based Media Art. Welcome to you both. Hi. Hi. I look forward to hearing the discussion. I'll take a seat now and let you take it away. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Hi, Kalan. Hi, Regina. It's great to see you. I want to start by saying congratulations on the sale. We're doing this post-sale. This is, in a way, a sort of post-mortem. Um, I hope that collectors are more eager than ever to hear your thoughts on uh, the piece now that they've had um, 24, 48 hours, however long, to, to play with the blobs. Um, where to start? There's a lot to go through. I spent a whole bunch of time playing um, with the series. Um, the blobs within blobs within blobs. But I want to talk about uh, the Asemic writing portion a little bit. Um, mm. There's been a few interviews that you had um, about the piece where you talked about Asemic writing already, but something that I noticed hasn't been discussed is how Asemic writing fits specifically into the fine arts. Um, maybe the most obvious example for me um, that comes to mind is Sai Twombly, but also Hans Arp. I'm a big Dada person. Yeah. Um, so I want to know if this is something you had thought about at all or you were thinking outside of maybe like the fine arts in general and just looking at like um, a semic text that maybe uh, the general public is more familiar with. Uh, I've been, um, thanks for the question and it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I, I've been working in the area of, of asymmetric writing among lots of other things that I've been doing for a long time. Um, in the mid 1990s, I started a project along with Cassidy Curtis and Jonathan Feinberg called the alphabet synthesis machine, which uh, interestingly was, uh, was actually commissioned uh, in 2001 by art 21 uh, for their website um, as a Java applet that unfortunately no longer runs, but it was a, a tool that would allow people to breed using genetic algorithms, the sort of hypothetically plausible writing systems of imaginary civilizations. Uh, it, it would allow you to download the, uh, like a, a, a font of the, of the nonsense alphabet you made. But I mean, this was part of like a kind of larger research into nonsense writing systems that have, I've, has been with me since I was a child. And so I've looked at it um, in a lot of ways, like, you know, you know many, many, many ways. Uh, including the fine arts, uh, you know, I, Max Ernst has some really amazing ones from, you know, post-war period. Um, uh, Bruno Minari, Hans Arp, as you mentioned. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I, books have been really, you know, a big part of this. And so like, there's some great books about this now that kind of contextualize what makes asemic writing interesting. Um, like there's this great book, you know, uh, asemic, the art of writing or, uh, this is another book, you know, writing by drawing, you know, when language seeks its other. These are uh, books. And of course, probably many people know, like one of the best known things people probably are aware of is something like Codex Seraphinianus, which is this yes. vis visual encyclopedia of an imaginary uh, world that has its own writing system as well. For me, this began when I was a really small child. Uh, I was at a synagogue. I was like uh, maybe maybe four, three or four years old. And I was pre precocious because I would learned how to read. Uh, but I was not, aware, and I was aware of the, the existence of Hebrew, but I was not aware of the existence of spoken Hebrew, but I was not aware of the existence of written Hebrew and that there could be other writing systems. I just didn't, didn't know, it didn't occur to me. And so I was in the synagogue and I was looking at the books and I was kind of very alarmed and confused and stressed because I was like, it, I thought something was wrong with my eyes because I didn't recognize the writing system. I was like, what's, what's going on here? Um, so uh, I was like, dad, what were, you know, an uncle, like, what is this? And, uh, and they were like, shush, this is how God talks to us. And from that moment on, I kind of got the idea that like, there was a kind of connection to a, a reality beyond language and, and to something kind of spiritual um, in these nonsense, like squiggles on a page. And that's kind of stayed with me. 
That's but, so interesting to me because I think about like my own interest in this concept of maybe universal language and especially 20th century art, but that's trying to find like a commonality while a Semic is more esoteric. It's about like, I think you've said the word nonsense, but then somehow tying it to, to God as if it is this language that is just like beyond our knowing. Um, it, it's interesting that you were thinking about that and have been basically your entire life. It's, it's an encounter with the unknown, uh, which is, you know, sort of conveyed through in, in even a piece like Cytographia. But this, uh, this, this notion of defamiliarization, which is a really common strategy in the arts, right? Like, like presenting something to somebody in a new way that makes them like jolt out of your, your you know, the, the slumber of everyday life to sort of see things in a new way. But the strategy of defamiliarization is to, is to kind of present you with, with things that, that, that are familiar enough, but also unfamiliar enough. And that's the experience I had when I was a child is I was defamiliarized by, by looking at written Hebrew that I hadn't seen and that I'm trying to kind of bring to cytographia with the asymmetric writing system that's in it. And uh, we can get more into talking about like the writing and the skeuomorphism of the paper, which has been a hot topic. Yeah. Uh, but I also was looking at the fact that you can kind of hide the paper as one of the features. So mm. I want to talk about that first and the decision to do that and then go in more into depth about, especially because I'm on the Art Block curatorial board and I'm one of those people who doesn't tend to like in most cases when artists apply with something related to paper. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But first mm -hmm. I wanted you to discuss this feature a little bit. All right, you know what? I, I wanna share my screen. I wanna, I wanna show, I'll show something. So, so here's uh, Cytographia. For those who haven't seen the piece before, it presents um, uh, imaginary diagrams of imaginary microorganisms from an imaginary book. Uh, and each sort of page has this uh, has a, features a different diagram. Each each sort of token or mint features a different cell, and it's a, it's an interactive living thing. I can kind of poke it and move it around. But the the thing that that and this is great. I mean, Regina is digging right into some details here that I'm very happy to talk about. Uh, Regina mentioned that um, if you look at the key commands here, and you, you see over here that Z Z command turns on and off the paper. I can do that. I can I can replace the paper with um, this flat background, which has the same average color as the original paper. I just take, take an average of the color, I replace it with that. And, you know, for that matter, I can zoom in over here by pressing the up arrow. And if you notice the lines, they have kind of a, um, kind of a wiggly quality. I can also turn that off as well. I could replace them with the default lines that the browser or P5.js would give me. So now I've done that. And now the lines are sort of smooth and homogenous lines. Um, and the question is, you know, does this make any sort of difference, right? Like if I if I look at this and I sort of turn them back on again, is there a difference? And we can turn we can turn off the screen now. Well, I'll we? say for me because maybe I'm too deep in it. Like um, we you've been uh, posting this project for a long time on Twitter, and I think mm -hmm. about the entire series as one book. And I don't know if you still think about it that way. And I do. Yeah. Maybe we'll go into more detail about why that paper matters or doesn't matter. Well, so I mean. Part of the reason I just showed the little demonstration I did was to make a claim that part of what makes this piece interesting is the way that it addresses the human perceptual system by bringing in noise, specifically one over F noise, you know, and a kind of organic noise that resembles in its frequency spectrum, the kind of noise that we see in the real world when we look at, well, paper or when we look at the wall, you know, and and when we look at lines that I draw and the kind of, you know, effects that they have, the real world is um, got a kind of a texture or a noise to it. It is not dead flat. You know, it is not perfectly straight. And there's a way in which um, we crave that. And I, 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 this is not to say that that ultra flat work, which I love and friends of mine make, you know, is sort of sterile and cold because it uses a flat background. And that's not to dismiss the, the place of, of extremely flat colors, perfect edges and things like that. But I believe that um, there's something gratifying. It tickles the eye and it keeps you involved when you realize there's some more information there. And in this case, um, I'm adding noise to the system. Now, your point would be, well, you're adding noise in a way which is skeuomorphic to old books, you know, and it's like, and yeah, you know, and I don't even mean old books. Like it's skeuomorphic to to tangible paper in general. Yeah. Well, let's let's 
I mean, I'm telling a kind of a history here, though, right? Right. Or I'm, I'm, I'm telling a historical fiction, I, I should say, right? You know, and I, I was, I was thinking about this as I was, um, you know, friends of mine and, and others were online saying, you know, well, you know, you shouldn't imitate paper because it's like that's not that goes against the sort of inherent properties of the computer medium. Sort of suggesting that the that you know a kind of default or inherent property of the computer medium is just to have a flat color, you know, or like a smooth gradient or something like this. And I was like, well, a, I want this kind of noise, but b, you know, like. I am situating this organic, responsive, interactive blob diagram creature thing, you know, in a context that is kind of a historical fiction. And I'm, I've, you know, if I figure, I reckon if movies can do that, if movies can create a historical fiction, I can create a historical fiction. And the historical fiction that I'm presenting here, which I, I, I'm trying to put into the background, it's, it's, it is literally the ground, not the foreground, but it is, it is. What I'll say is that I think there's a difference between um, historical fiction and film or television having, um, uh, making costumes in the contemporary era that are supposed to mimic like 18th century cost, uh, clothing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the same as putting like a, an Instagram filter that makes your uh, photograph your video look like it's film when it's digital. Like, I think there's a divide there. Mm -hmm. However, I've been thinking more about this skeuomorphism, especially with paper. And for me, it ultimately, um, first of all, it has to be thoughtfully made like cryptographia is, but it has to have an intent. And I feel like specific to cryptographia, like, Cytographia. It's about cells. Sorry. <laughs> I, maybe I'll repeat that. We'll cut it's that okay. Out. You've got it's fine. You you got a fever. You're you're, you're yeah. committed. Yeah. Um we'll see, I'll go back. <laughs> Everyone uh, who's listening, Regina is doing this with a hundred degree fever right now. So I I cut you I don't know fully so much slack. Um, but uh specific to cytographia, like there is a particular intent to including this type of skeuomorphism that is paper, uh, whether we want to consider it just from the perspective of it being noise or not. I mean, I think you know, there's so many ways to explore uh, media specificity of the digital that isn't flat or smooth or whatever, you know, already pixel, you know, we can go into that. There's other right. ways to explore, but um, there is a very specific intention here that you have that makes uh, the purpose uh, more, you know, uh, respectable to me. Um, that said, I've kind of like gone down this path now about thinking through the reality that as long as we're uh, making work, even in digital formats that follow the physics of the tangible world, there's still some level of skeuomorphism to that. And uh, that would probably cover like a majority, if not all of our blocks curated projects anyway. <laughs> so, so, so the computer is a simulation machine, you know, and um, when people imitate light hitting surfaces, when people imitate three dimensional things, on a two-dimensional graphical screen. You know, like this is a kind of skeuomorphism. For me, for me, cytographia, like I, I, it's not that I don't wanna dwell on the paper, but for me, the, the, the heart of the project is, and the part that I think is sort of essential to the computer medium, the fact that it's interactive, responsive, dynamic, that it's, you know, it's generative, that it's, uh, it's a simulation, that it evolves over time, that it never repeats, that it um, is something you can poke at and sort of alter and play with and actually, you know, in a way, there's a there's a sandbox mode you can control and create yourself. So all of that is the is the aspect which for me is the part where I'm like, this is the essential computer medium. Ah, but you're offering prints. <laughs> so we'll talk about that and how it is the print that you are that's yeah. intangible form less uh, cytographia somehow then. That's interesting. So first of all, they're technically not prints, they're, they're, they're plotter drawings. And I think the difference there is that there really is a pen that's really pushing into paper. Uh, you know, like, like there's a, there's a substantial, like this force that's being pushed into paper. There's an However, indentation. We're, we're stilling the image, right? Bob? Yes, you are stilling the image. You know, um, I mentioned this in another interview. Uh, it took me decades to kind of come around to the idea that it, it's okay to have a kind of mortal coil that um, is archival that lasts longer than software can last. Um, I have very little work from when I was in my twenties because at the time I was like, so, you know, software is the is the is the only thing. Everything should be interactive and dynamic. And then you know, my heart was broken one time after another as you know suddenly. Java no longer worked in the browser and suddenly, you know, director and flash no longer worked in the browser. And, you know, uh, suddenly 
you know, Mac OS apps that I'd made no longer worked or, you know, the, in, in, in new versions of the operating system, my heart was broken again and again as software that I'd made became obsolete. And I saw, you know, literally tens of thousands of artworks and games made by myself and my peers and, you know, my community, you know, become not, not just obsolete, but literally inaccessible to generations of people who would then be condemned to repeat it in some way or another. Right. Like, so, so the idea that I have very little I can show from my twenties breaks my heart because I was like, Oh, I made all these things. And, and, and to, uh, to have a kind of mortal coil that is uh, associated with them. I still think of the digital one as the main part of the piece, um, but I like the idea of there being a kind of physical sort of sidecar. Um, and I, I actually, I also like the sort of detour maw that's happened now with um, something like Art Forum, where they're like, "Yes, this is the sort of sidecar to the real thing, which is the, the virtual NFT." You know, the, no one's no one's basically saying that like the real thing is the plot. And that the NFT is just this kind of like sidecar. The real thing is this thing that lives in the blockchain in its own way, kind of permanent. But that the, you know, the other thing is like collectors, if they like, if they've collected my piece, I assume it's because they like my piece and they may want to live with it in a different way. Mm. Some of the, I don't know all the collectors, there's 418 of them, but, but some of them are good friends of mine. And um, I presume they may have collected the piece because they don't even, like the piece or not it's just that they like me and they want to have a little piece of me in their house and to be able to put that on the wall and sort of sort of say i go and made that you know you can see a signature there it I there's mean, a reason complex and awesome and like this culmination in many ways of the the work you've been doing with blobs for for decade for over decades so it's like i'm pretty sure all your collectors love the work i will say you know um but, but, but they can have but i mean sometimes you, you want work because some, a certain person made it and then you want to live with it in a way which is different than having a screen you know i mean how but many... i will say that I, I still find it interesting that you know you had said earlier how what what's really the core of the piece and what's essential to the piece is this interactivity and thinking about the plotter drawing as this um, supplement in a sense that's still important, but it's it's documentation really. It's like it's archival, um, and it can still be displayed as an artwork. It is artwork, but it's it's almost like um, an index of. I, I think that's accurate. It's it's um I, I would think of it, I would think of it as a photograph to the. Rafael Lozano Hammer has said that like whenever you set up a software based installation, it's performance art, you know, and and I kind of agree, and I think even. Sadly, something like Cytographia being an interactive, you know, browser based software may someday cease to work in the browser for really dumb reasons, just because and I say that because I've had my heart broken so many times, as I explained. Unless we emulate the browser, but unless we, I mean, like, yes, I mean, yeah, yeah but it's a live but, browser and yeah, I know there's a there's a difference. But sure. but but yeah. but having a, having a kind of uh, uh, I think of the plot as kind of a, a photograph of the of the of the performance art and um, but a nice one, uh, you know, a photograph that's kind of like been touched by the artist and um has their spares their signature and is unique um and is something that you can enjoy like you know in 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 your space in a different way than having something on the screen like it's a screen-based work and 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 it is interactive and responsive and all that but how many times have you seen these kinds of things fail where you know somebody says oh we're going to sell screens for your house that you can show your generative art on things like surface and all and these things come and go you know it's like it's like you don't always want that either. You don't always want the glow. You know, it, it, sometimes you, you you don't even always want to have to plug something in. Uh, sometimes it's just nice to have a piece of paper. So there you go. So um, what the two have in common, though, is uh, that the output had so many lines of code. I mean, <sighs> I'm not sure if this is the largest art blocks project. It's not. I've been told it's not. Created. It's one of. I think I know then what the largest. It's one it's, it's 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 not the largest one. The yeah. I I had some some conversations with the staff about this. The largest one had some uh, sort of preloaded data that it was loading to manipulate and then produce generative stuff there from. Um, mm -hmm. This one does not. It's it's just really big. Uh, why is it so big? Yeah, I want to talk about that. Like, what was the reason for having so many lines of code? For okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it for those in, in listening, uh, it, there, it was about 30,000 lines of code. And uh, it ended up like it was un, uncompressed or unminified, as we say. Uh, it was around 700 and some odd kilobytes of code, which, you know, through minification for the sake of the blockchain, I brought down to around 250 kilobytes of code, which is still a ton and required 12 ETH blocks 
right? Blocks on the blockchain. 12 was an, is an absurd number. Uh, most of the time people um, try to get it under one. And um, thank you to the node operators upkeeping that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, one reason, one reason why you don't see a lot of work that big is just because it's very expensive to publish. Um, you know, like every time you, you, you're putting a block on the blockchain, it's costing like a full 24 kilobytes. It's costing a few hundred dollars or something like this, depending when you do it and gas prices and so on. So it's, you know, it's suddenly a lot, it adds up. Um, uh, why was it so big? Well, there's a lot of things in it. I mean, I've been working on the project for two years. Uh, there's a system to generate the paper. It's not, there's not like one paper. I'm not like preloading a paper image. You know, it's it, every print has unique paper. There's a generative writing system, which you don't see very much of because it's actually kind of on the backside of the page, but, um, <laughs> but there's a generative writing system and the little labels are, are, are using it. And that's a whole subsystem. Um, the, if I can switch to the screen for a second, um, uh, if I switch my screen just for, just for a moment, I'm going to clear this one here. Uh, I'll make a blank one. Um, one reason why it's so big is because if I pick a certain type of um, shape, let's call, I call them wheels. Here, these are wheels. Here's one type of wheel. Here's another. Here's another. Here's another. Here's another. Here's another. Like each of these is their own type of wheel. Um, you know, and like each of them requires sort of their own kind of code. And this is just one type. Of, we can switch back now. Um, thanks. So like what you're seeing there is like, each one of these requires sort of subroutines that kind of deal with how the organelles are decorated in different ways. And each of these requires careful attention to line weight. And sometimes the way that it's just the way that it's drawn is, is like, if I just had one type of wheel and by the way, the wheel is just one of one of approximately a dozen different types of organelles that are in the system, which I'm happy to talk about at length, but, but, well, I mean, each, each one requires its own sort of code to do. This might be a way to also talk about um, the initial um, inspiration for creating these specific shapes and the relationship to the, to the natural world and the, the um, essays and books you're reading on that topic and how they kind of show up specifically in the image. I mean, it's we could screen share a whole bunch if it's helpful to illustrate this to those listening. Um, I'm not sure I was I, I prepared for that. Uh, I mean, one thing I'd say is uh, I've been thinking about blobs a long time and um, families of blobs. And um, I don't have at my fingertips, you know, like my very first blob project was I was I was 19 at the media laboratory where I was uh, contributing to a project directed by Patty Mace. And she had a whole team of people making a sort of camera based interaction where you could point at something and these sort of blobs would float in. Like, so like I've been thinking about blobs for a long time and I the the thing that I like about them is the sort of it's a way that you are the artist when the artist can make a form that's truly your own mm -hmm. on a computer. So much of my my own art and my pedagogy is concerned with what I would call and what, I, what I've called reclaiming computation as a medium of personal expression, and. Right off the bat, I mean, you know, this is made by large companies, you know, and then inherits from a kind of military industrial tradition, you know, and to sort of reclaim, reclaim this and make this one's own, to make one's own shapes, to make one's own lines, to make one's own background, you know, is to kind of reclaim this as a personal space. Um, and blobs are this are this thing, unlike a rectangle, which, you know, is a, is a command rect, you get a command, you, you know, you get a you know, ellipse, you get it, you get these kinds of ready-made shapes. And there's, again, this is nothing against artists who find creative ways to use those ready-made shapes, but the circle is not my circle. The circle is everyone's circle. And it's great. If you can use everyone's circle to make something that's truly your own, go for it. And there's ways of doing that. Um, but I, I think a great challenge both to myself, to my students is to make your own shape. And when I ask students, as I do to, um, make their own blob, it, it stumps them. It, it's beautifully because they're like, well, what do you mean? How do I do that? And I'm like, I don't know, figure it out. I can, you know, I can rattle off six ways of doing it right. and more. Right. You know, it's, it's an assignment in my book with Tiga. It's, it's like, you know, you figure it out. There's, there's no, there's no right answer. And that's, it's, that makes it a great challenge. It makes it a, for me, for my students, a rite of passage. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great test 
uh, of their metal uh, to make an attractive blob, to make a good shape. Um, Chris Alexander, who's a hero, and I've you know talked about like he has a whole chapter in his book on good shape, you know, and and um, some students don't even understand this. I'm, I'm like, make a good shape, and they're like, man, what do you mean make a good shape? And I'm like, you got a lot to learn, you know. That's, I mean, but, I mean uh, what I'm interested in for this particular project for Cytographia is that its particular relationship in this evolution to like I think I was trying to really refer to like the nature of order which you were looking at and this idea of, of specific organic or natural shapes are creating kind a kind of system around um, these speculative materials and that relationship to lobbiness. I can talk about the nature of order. Um, yes, that's what I, that's what I was kind of trying to get at. Let, yeah. let me pull up the picture. Hold on. Give me, give me a second. Uh, it's in my GitHub. Chris Alexander may he rest in peace is kind of also a guilty pleasure of mine in terms of like as an artist and an author and an architect um uh he's considered by my architecture colleagues kind of this uh, utopian idealist hippie uh who you know has strong opinions about what good form is that are almost kind of retro conservative they're they're actually kind of reactionary uh the, he, he's sort of the tip like like he's a quintessential anti-modern architect like he's like he, and there's a there's a way in which like like there is a reactionary aspect to him is like saying like, you know, it was much better in the old days, you know, you know, make form great again. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of like, there's a little bit of a scary edge to that, but it's so humanistic and so respects our perception and our existence as, as humans that I, I do love it. And his book pattern language, for example, is incredibly close to my heart, even though it does sort of harken back to a kind of um, maybe a, a nostalgic yearning for the past that never existed. But, there's some incredible points in there about how to structure the world. And in his, in his um, more recent series of books, The Nature of Order, he talks about how to structure form. And I just was really inspired by this particular sort of set of 15 properties of living systems. Now, making living things, making a living object is a kind of a, another kind of chestnut in, in, in computer art. You know, whether you're making non-player characters in a, in a video game or you're making uh, imaginary creatures like like the Promethean sort of Frankensteinian kind of like make a living thing. Um, I didn't come up with that. Let's just say, right. I mean, like, like plenty of people do that. Um, what I liked about Alexander's 15 properties of living systems is that they seem to apply to the shape of things. Um, not just to the way things move, which for me is a big deal, but, but to how things are structured, um, like the deep structure of things. Uh, and these are observations he's made about like what looks organic and, and how what what structures organic things have and since i was building in some sense the building blocks of living material or making these kinds of ultra simple living organisms these microorganisms which of course are quite complex and like palimpsests they contain you know multitudes uh i these um form th these properties i thought were, were really they were kind of a constant guide now a couple of them really obvious right like strong center this is to say like there's a nucleus in a cell, like there's a, a place which is the center. Additionally, though, you know, even like subparts often have a center and a periphery, right? Boundaries, this idea of like a thick cell wall. Uh, in the pattern language, he, you know, Alexander talks about this kind of like thick walls being this kind of like fantasy he has, like, like you know, like, but 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 also that that cells have thick walls and that um, these these other properties played into the development of of cytography in a lot of interesting ways. Um, roughness, for example, on the upper right-hand side, individuality. This is this idea that if I had several different items, organelles, I would not make them identical, but I would introduce small amounts of variation so that they were each individual and slightly different from the other, okay? This is part of what took so long to make the piece and part of why the code expanded so big because I could just say, just use a circle, but instead I'm saying, well, actually make my own little circular shape and you know, give them variation. So likewise with echoes, similarity, sort of something similar, like I, I'd have versions of things that would be copied and, and pasted, but with variation as well. Um, uh, alternating repetition, all those things sort of form a kind of a group of, of like having, when you have the same thing repeated, which organisms do, right? We've got multiple ribs, just to take an example, but your ribs aren't all identical, right? I got multiple fingers, my fingers aren't all identical. And, and to have these kinds of, um, 
repetitions, alternations, echoes, and roughness was very important. Roughness also, of course, talks about my point about paper and, and line, like I made talk about earlier. But then there were other things like um, void. You know, when I was developing cytographia, Uh, some I have, I'll say it took me a year to make the automatic layout algorithm to figure out how to populate the once I had the cell wall yeah. how to how to put shit in there so that it didn't just like look like trash because you could just throw trash in there in random locations but it's not you can see that it's not it doesn't it feels organic and I mean this really gets me thinking even more about the conversation we were having about paper and. <laughs> physics and, and tangible reality and this idea of mimicking living systems in digital forms or like, where is that line between like organic living forms and, you know, zeros and ones and, and why simulate that? And like, so I'm kind of like going down a rabbit it's a, it's a joy to, It's a joy to try and make something that, that has a kind of organic logic to it. And, you know, I did, I, 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 initially, at the early stages of the project, I did do some visual research where I went into looking at old diagrams and I went into looking at diagrams specifically of microorganisms, whether it was like from 1665, from the original Micrographia, where Robert Hooke, you know, presents the, his discovery of cells, uh, but also just looking at lots of pictures of, of uh, that stuff. I actually have all my visual research. If we, if we had another hour and you didn't have a fever, I'd be happy to pull it out. But um, but just to say, like like voids, for example, was was an interesting one because I had made this algorithm to populate the cell wall, and I just threw a bunch of stuff in there, but it would it would lay stuff out. But then it always looked too crowded. And when I looked at this, I was like, oh, voids. We can just have areas that have nothing in them, and that's okay. And I can give myself permission. Well, it have... also gives room for the uh, blobs and the the to bounce to have yeah. mobility. That's you right. know, you can't have mobility if you fill up the entire space. And I'm grateful uh, for that because it's fun. Exactly, exactly that. right. The ones that are, are too filled up, sometimes you, you, you there's some little I, my organelles that will sometimes, as you say, swim around, move around, do stuff. And if it's too crowded, they don't have space to do that. And the voids was like this, like, oh, yeah, voids. So that's an example of how this visual logic, uh, we can turn it off. Um, it's an example of how this visual logic you know, inspired the piece or helped guide the piece, really. And you mentioned earlier how the asemic code doesn't, or images don't really show up in the work. I mean, for the ones that I went through that kind of show that backside of them, they there is this tangibility of um, like seeing that kind of ink, that ink feel that you really went for, you know. Um, I think it still has purpose, at least from my perspective. But it makes me want to ask, maybe a controversial question, I call this a post-mortem at the beginning, is um, is there anything that you would change about the piece or like what are some big decisions that changed over the process of going through 30,000 lines of code? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Let me say, I, I've never made a perfect artwork. Okay, that's not a, that's not, I'm not, I'm not, 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 neither is it a humble thing nor is it a false humble thing. I'm just saying like, so I can say, you know, like any artist should be able to say, like, I see all kinds of flaws in cytographia. And it's, I, I, when I speak now critically of it, you know, and I say things like, you know, even I am conflicted about the paper, for example, but, but, but when I say things critical of it, it's not to shit on it. It's to say just, you know, I've, I've, it's, it's, it is what it is. And I, it, it led me where it led me. Um, particularly in software development, sometimes you make decisions, technical choices early on that then, you know, kind of corral you more narrowly and more narrowly towards certain kinds of conclusions that then are very difficult to undo later on when you're just like, oh, I really would have liked to have done it differently this way or that way. A really simple example, um, somebody somewhere in the Discord or Twitter was like, oh, I wish you could do flagella, you know? And, and I was like, yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, to have parts of the creature that protrude outside of the cell, that, that operate outside of the cell, like a flagellum, like different kinds of articulated hairs, uh, even pseudopods in a better way than I was able to implement them, like really, you know, like with the vacuoles kind of like, you know, getting yeah, through. Yeah, like, going in and out of the barrier through osmosis. Yeah, yeah, like really, really having pseudopods kind of like, I I would have had to have made a 
some decisions earlier on about how to design the sort of the core form and how um, the particle system work. Right now, it's there. It's not. It's not legal within my universe to have particles outside of the cell wall. In fact, when that happens, it crashes uh, or can crash, and um, uh, and so I can't have interesting things like flagella. And so there's entire like phyla of, of microorganisms that I'm not able to access metaphorically. You know, it can't, I can't even, I, now I didn't actually study micro microorganisms too carefully because I wanted to kind of have my, my response to them be sort of intuitive rather than sort of reduplicative. Well, I also like this idea of them being like, um, speculative or yeah. kind of fitting within like the objects being a semic in a way, or just being like imaginative, being like of you and your personal expression. So I think if it was too um, scientific, like then. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it occurred to me early on, I was like, I could make Golgi bodies and I can make this, that and the other. And I was like, but no, I'm just gonna kind of like take a visual inspiration from it and just be like getting a vibe as opposed to like, you know, traducing, you know, this is this and this is that. Um, you know, sort of, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this kind of organelle, that kind of organelle. So I'm just generally, generally taking more inspiration from it and also sort of meeting it where I could with the physics that I'd made. I was like, okay, well, I can make long skinny things and I can make circular things and I can make line things and blob things. And I was like, this is the language that I'm able to make with the physics that I've created. Um, so there's that. But yeah, one thing I would love to have done differently if I could have engineered it with this in mind from the beginning was to sort of make the periphery more, more articulated. Um, the last question I want to ask is like very typical of me and conservation, but uh, a little bird told me that you included some on-chain metadata in a way that most art blocks projects do not, or, you know, 99.9% .9 of projects out there that utilize um, blockchain uh, do not. So I like uh, to maybe about there was, there was a, yeah. So there was, there was, thank you for reminding me of this. There was a, there was a funny glitch. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our, uh, Cytographia has 12, 24 kilobyte Ethereum blocks on the blockchain. Uh, so it's, you know, there's a lot of, of code. And uh, there was a kind of a weird glitch or error or bug as I was uploading uh, block number eight out of 12. And my browser kind of froze and it was kind of a mess. And then it just kind of like burped. And I was like, what was that? And it was weird. And then the next thing I knew, uh, you know, I, I was just, I was like, okay, I guess, I guess that was nothing. And I was able to continue and I uploaded the rest of the blocks. Um, at the end of it, um, we tried to launch the program and it wouldn't work. And, you know, it just, it wasn't working. I was like, but it worked on the test site. Everything was going on perfectly. It should have worked. And then uh, an engineer in art blocks very helpfully said, well, this one variable is d defined twice. How is that possible? And they correctly diagnosed that one block I had accidentally uploaded twice, which is to say I paid for a whole extra block of Ethereum stuff containing like a duplication of the code. But right. the way that the blocks ran together, um, there was a chunk of code that was essentially duplicated. And I was like, okay, well, can I just delete that block? And because it was block number eight, deleting that block would have meant that there were 13 blocks at that point. I would have had to, to do it in an orthodox way. I would have had to delete eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13, and then re-upload all those blocks, which would cost an arm and a leg to do, I wish I didn't have. So I was like, oh God, this is terrible. What can I do? And um, the engineer suggested, well, just, just comment it out. And just you'll just have this like chunk of junk, you know, kind of being there. And I was like, well, that seems like that's a, that's a great technical solution, but what a waste. Like I have all this like space I've paid for. Uh, I could replace it. I just can't pull it out. Um, so I, I decided I'm just gonna, and I had like, I had to do this all within seconds. I just thought quickly, all right, I'm just going to plop a whole shitload of human readable metadata into this one block and just be like, blam. And so I, I copied, you know, my bio and the project description and the display notes and a whole bunch of, you know, thank yous and the references and, you know, the acknowledgements and everything. It was just like, all right, just like shove it in there. It was 7,000 characters. Didn't even come close to feeling a third of the block, but I was just like, blam, and put it in there. So there's a whole chunk of human readable, I think it's in Markdown. Um, you know, stuff that's in there that would not have gotten there otherwise. And I wouldn't say it would help for the long-term preservation of the piece in a technological sense, but in a kind of conceptual sense so that people know what is this gobbledygook they're looking at. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I will say that um, in uh, when everybody talks about their work being on chain or whatever, but you you can't even see who the artist was who deployed X because that's not actually on chain. Like, I encourage more people to upload uh, their metadata to um, their smart contracts or to a block if they run into a similar situation. I mean, it may be interesting if art blocks start implementing more of that themselves. Um, instead of, as in most cases, it's a token URI, right? That actually is um, not, you know, it's, it's referenced out to a, a third party domain yeah. or AP, whatever, that has even more consequences from a conservation perspective. Not to say, as you mentioned, that the blockchain itself is a preservation tool. But um, I love that about this project, that even though it was totally, you know, happenstance, um, you know, based on an error. Yeah. Um, and I think we can end that there with that little like insider baseball, some tech stuff for those interested. Um, and thank you, Regina. And thank yeah. you, Artblox, for having me here today. All right. Yeah, it's a great stopping point. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, thanks again, Regina and Golan, for this discussion and kind of letting us all eavesdrop in on your chat. Before we leave, I want to let everyone know that you can join us in the Discord if you haven't already, where we talk about generative art all day, every day. There's a link here in the show notes. You can follow us on Twitter, artblocks underscore IO. Uh, you'll find other links in the show notes, um, like the link to the Cytographia project page, uh, some of the other topics discussed today. And uh, thanks again to our guests and those tuning in. Until next time, take care, everybody.